Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 342 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined as ever by my best friend and former heavyweight world title challenger, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing this week, my man? I'm doing good, my man. How about you? Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. You already know. Let's dive straight into the review part of the show. We're going to start here last Friday. Friday, uh, April 29th at the Vegas City Hall in Russia. One fight to mention over here. Fedor Chudinov, um, former world champion, now 25-3 and three with a draw. He lost a unanimous decision over 10 against Azizbek Abdugufarov, who is now... Um, I probably butchered that name, but he's now 14-1. and one. He actually had a point deducted, Abdugufarov, but um, managed to still win. He had a point deducted, I think it was round eight. Good for him. Moving out now to the Virgin Hotels, Las Vegas. This one was a Roy Jones Jr. card. Um, again, Friday, April 29th. Uh, let's start with the undercard. Keith Hunter, my good friend, now 15-1, and one, a unanimous decision over 10 rounds against the previously undefeated Damarius Driver, who's now 12-1. and one. Um, Really good fighter, by the way, was Driver. Obviously hadn't ever heard of him, not sure where they got him from. No belt on the line. You know, a lot at stake, really, between two good fighters. So, um, not sure what the kind of business move was behind that fight but he caused a lot of problems I actually had it 4-4 going into round 9 and I gave Hunter the last two rounds so I was really happy for him Um, but it was a great great fight as well that one was on Fight TV um Sharif Rackman with a win. He's now 6-0. A unanimous decision over six rounds against Reyes Sanchez, who's now 7-2. and uh, We had a win as well for Gerald McClellan Jr. He's now 2-0. and A majority decision over four rounds against Demetrius Alexander, who's now 1-1. One and, one. and the main event, of course, James McKenzie Morrison now 20-0 and with two draws. He TKO'd in round five. Hassim Rackman Jr., who's now 12-1. and It was for the vacant WBC United States. States heavyweight title, which Morrison now has. Um, round one, Hassim Rackman Jr. was uh, was was doing well with his timing. I liked his timing. He looked really relaxed in there. He switched stances a few times. He did get caught with a couple of hard-looking right hands, but for me, he did enough to win the round. I think Rackman's uh, jab was working nicely. Rackman made Morrison miss a lot. Morrison was blowing heavy at the end of round one, for crying out loud. Round two, I gave to Rackman as well. I felt he was going to the body a few times. I liked that. Morrison was breathing so heavily, as I said. Morrison was... um, Utterly ineffective, really, unless unless Rackman gave up space and kind of sat on the ropes and invited pressure, which he did do a couple of times. And I just felt as long as Rackman keeps his feet moving and doesn't stand still in front of Morrison, he can win this fight so easily. And Morrison was just walking into range, uh, or, or attempting to walk into range, and just walking into a Rackman jab every single time. He wasn't jabbing his way in, he was just walking straight into that jab. 2-0 Rackman. Um... Round three, a better round for Morrison. I don't think it was enough for him to win it, but he did land uh, the best puncher of the fight up until that point. Rackman threw a lazy jab and got caught with a big right hand. And the power of Morrison, as we know, is very, very real. It's in the blood. Um, Rackman was was, kind of having to prove his chin a lot earlier than I'd have hoped for as a friend, as a former co-host of the show. And... As I said, he couldn't really afford to stand in front of Morrison. Rackman, I felt, needed to keep his hands up. And when he jabs, um, you know, Morrison wasn't able to really get past the jab. So I wanted to see him get back to that. Round four, I gave to Morrison. Uh, just about. I didn't like Rackman constantly backing up, inviting the pressure. He didn't seem to have the power as well to deter Morrison from completely 
just coming forward exclusively and, and trying to walk through Rackman's punches. And Rackman was starting to look a little bit tired as well, round four. And Morrison seemed to be finding a bit of a second wind. And then round five, down goes Hassim Rackman. He, he initially got caught with a left hook, followed by a right hand, I believe it was. And he kind of hunched over and froze, but he was on his feet. And it was clearly like a delayed reaction. And Morrison actually gave him a couple seconds and then realized, oh, oh damn, he's hurt. And he, and he threw, I think it was an extra punch, which pretty much splattered Rackman down in a heap. Rackman did get up and beat the count, and then Morrison walked over to him, landed a few left hands, a few jabs, and you just knew he was waiting for the right time to throw the right hand. And the first right hand he threw was an uppercut, and the referee waved it off. Um, Hassim Rackman, uh, you know protesting the stoppage of the referee uh, Morrison as I say was blowing so hard he was actually blowing while Rackman was have, you know while the referee was waving it off the fight's finished and he was still blowing so hard um, I felt the stoppage was maybe a tiny bit premature maybe but I felt Rackman was running out of steam and Morrison was starting to take over so it's a big blow really for Hassim Rackman um, I felt that he was in full control and yeah I mean once again that that Morrison power is certainly real. Gutted for Hassim Rackman. Spoke to him um, after the fight, of course. I spoke to him, um, I think it was the same day as the fight, because the hours were weird. It started it started really late. I think it, it started around about 7 a.m. UK time, about 11 a.m. Uh, Vegas time, and that would be uh, about 2 in the morning your time, Eddie, on, on uh, Eastern time. So, um, crazy time to start, and... Um, I did speak to him. Um, I think he's he's doing okay, and he said that this is something that he kind of needed to to you know to use as motivation going forward. He wants a rematch. Uh, we will see if it happens. Moving out now to the MGM Grand um, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Let's start with the undercard. Um, I didn't see some of this undercard, but I know Nico Ali Walsh picked up a good knockout in round one against Alejandro Alejandro Ibarra, who's now seven and two. Nico Ali Walsh, 5-0. and um, Keyshawn Davis with a win. He's now 5-0. and A TKO in round 6 against Esteban Sanchez, who's now 18-2. and uh, Wins as well for Andres Cortez. He's now 17-0. and A KO in round 6 against Alexis Del Bosque, who's now 18-6 and with a draw. And Raymond Muratala, who's now 14-0. and A KO in round 3 against Jeremy Hill, who's who's now 16-3, and three. but the main event, all eyes on that, Oscar Valdez now 30-1, and one. he loses his O, and Shakur Stevenson remains undefeated and extends that win streak, 18 wins in a row now, it was of course a unification between the WBC and WBO champions, Valdez down in round 6, um, such a dominant performance from Shakur Stevenson, I mean honestly, I think it was hard to even find a single round for uh, for Oscar Valdez, I was very impressed with Shakur Stevenson. I think we spoke about it briefly on last week's show, Eddie, that perhaps uh, Stevenson is all wrong for Valdez and Valdez is all right for Stevenson in terms of the style clash. Just being a pure boxer, being a you know a great counter a great counter puncher, and just having a fantastic defense as well. So um, yeah, Shakur looked good, man. He looked good against another really really good fighter. That's got to be the best win of his career by miles. Yeah, I think so. He looked <clears throat> extremely dominant. It just looked like a bad, terrible matchup for Oscar Valdez from round one on, man. I mean, it was it was crazy. And I've always been, I've always since he turned pro, I've been a fan of Shakur. He's done a lot of good, you know, a lot of good in his young career already. So, um, and his ability, you know, he, he just seems so in control. You know what I mean? His, his, his balance was great. His defense was always good. And it was great, um, even though like some of those straight right hands were getting in from Valdez a little bit. I think he knew the range he needed to be at. So even though they were kind of touching him, I think they were coming up short. The power wasn't enough on him. And then I don't think Valdez was a hundred percent putting effort into him each one because he was so concerned defensively, which he had to be. And uh, Shakur kept that hand out that he kept extending that right hand out to kind of measure a little bit some illegalness going on with it every now and again but I felt like it was just you know in the, in the, in the flow of the fight he got warned about it a few times but I think all in all he just it was it was it was a beautiful performance by Shakur Stevenson it showed me it showed me that 
there's, in my opinion, of all the guys that are surrounding those weights, the ones that we talk about all the time, I think he's either the top one or an elite or or number two, maybe the tank. Everybody else, I think, is a little bit behind them, even if they're in better position as far as like Combosis is with the belts, or you know, and the fact that um, uh, Devin Haney's about to fight him, um, and whoever comes up, of course, after that is going to be you know pretty 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 solid, you know, and in the driver's seat, at least with the belts or when the belts are with the with the belts are concerned. So, um, but I still think Shakur skill wise and ability wise, um, just what he's able to do, how he's able to control range and his offense is, his punch selections is beautiful. I think he's probably the best next to the tank, to be honest. So, um, excited to see what's going, you know, what's going to be, uh, next for him. And for Valdez, I mean, look, you can't, there's no shame in losing to a kid like that. He's a superstar on the rise. And obviously Valdez can come back up and rise back up and be something, some, a player in that division. Maybe later on, <laughs> after Shakur leaves it, uh, I think he probably will be. But um, great fight, uh, great performance. It was uh, it was great to see. Yeah, you spoke about Shakur, you know, being in control in the fight. And he was, I mean, you know, in control of the action, in control of the distance, in control of the pace of the fight, dictating pretty much everything uh, from from the get-go, really. And Valdez was having success with just kind of singular shots, maybe two or three per round early on. Um, obviously, down he went. As I mentioned, he got punched into the ropes and kind of bounced off them into a shot. It was really weird. I can see why he was arguing why it shouldn't have been counted, but a punch did land, but it was weird. And then... As we say, I mean, Shakur started to have fun as it as as the fight you know progressed, and Valdez started to get frustrated, and um, you could see the face marking up of Valdez. We've seen it happen many times in the past. Shakur looked really fresh, you know, still in full control late on. Valdez was starting to get caught, and he was banging his gloves together in anger, and he was just being picked off. And as we've said before, Shakur's defense is almost perfect. His movement, his judge of distance. Um, He's got it all. He's such a special fighter. You know, the speed, the athleticism, as I say, the defense, the head movement, the footwork, the counter-punching ability, being massive for the weight despite still being relatively new to the weight. You know, he's got a good engine. He's a southpaw, for God's sake. Like, he's got it all. And the only thing I think he lacks is probably a little bit of power, but I don't actually think he needs it because it's not like um, he doesn't punch hard enough. It's just not probably one of his strongest points he doesn't really have a weak point but he honestly has it all and it's just a pleasure to watch him fight every time we see him fight some people are not fans of his fine you don't have to be but we have to you know respect what he brings to the game because he is such a great fighter and we've known it from day one really I mean such you know he's always been full of promise and yeah to see him now you know, being a multi-weight world champion already, and oh, I remember him saying to me that he was excited when he won the world title, but it was just like a, a new pair of sneakers, and after a few weeks, it kind of just wore off, like, wow, how can you even talk about a world title like that, some guys dream of getting to that position, this guy, you know, it's, it's what he expects to be doing with his career, so he is such a confident uh, and, and talented young man. Um, moving out now to the Madison Square Garden in New York, USA. This one over here. Let's start with the undercard. It was on the zone. Um, a win for Sky Nicholson. Another win. I think she's three and zero with all three wins on point. She was able to beat Shaniqua Davis, who's now three and two. Good stuff there for Sky Nicholson. I think she's had two of her three fights in the states, which is crazy because she's an Australian lady living in the UK, training in the UK, and fighting mostly in America. It doesn't make much sense, but good for her. Um, a win for Reshat Matty as well. He's now twelve and zero, a unanimous decision over eight against Joe Eli Hernandez, who's now twelve and two. Galau Yafai with a good win, really good win, two and zero. Now he made his opponent retire after just two rounds. Miguel Carter Gina, who's now 17 and 7 with a draw. I think that's probably the quickest he's been stopped. And he's been in there, uh, been in there with some good fighters. That one was for the WBC International Flyweight title. Austin Amo Williams with an explosive win. Uh, a first round knockout against Chordal Booker, who's now um, 17 and 1. And Austin Williams now 11, 11 and 
11-0. That one was for the vacant WBA Continental America's middleweight title. Uh, title. When Amo Williams kind of went off the rails, I don't think many people knew what he was going to be like after that. I think he was graffitiing on walls. He said he wanted to punch Eddie Hearn in the face. And no one kind of knew what was going on. He was having some serious issues outside of the ring. And he said he's done with boxing. He, he values himself too much. It was crazy, the things he was coming out with. But it seems like he's got rid of all of that, and he's back, and he's better than ever, actually. So it's, it's good to see him back on the right track, at least. Um, French on Cruz Desern with a win. She's now 8-1. and one. She was able to dethrone Elin Sederuz, who I think had maybe one or two of the belts. Sederuz was undefeated, 8-0. and oh. She's now 8-1. and one. It was over points there. Uh, wide in the end for French on Cruz. Um, she's now the undisputed super middleweight uh, world champion WBC, WBA, IBF and WBO so credit to her as well still has that single loss on her record to Clarissa Shields um, Jesse Vargas stepped in against Liam Smith of the UK brilliant win for Liam Smith a TKO in round 10 he's now 31-3 and three with a draw Jesse Vargas now 29-4 and four with two draws it was for the vacant WBO Intercontinental Super Welterweight title um, again this fight here you know, it was a fight that I don't feel like there was much point of it, really, before it happened. And even afterwards, I'm not sure if it was some kind of eliminator or something. But, I don't know. In a way, I guess it was good for Liam Smith to get the win in the fashion he did. But it was expected to be a real hard war. Jesse Vargas never had been stopped. But, you know, I think, even though he's kind of big and stuff, I, I, I just always favoured Liam Smith to to have too much, be too strong, you know, the body attacks and stuff. I mean, he, he absolutely mauled uh, Vargas, to be honest with you. And Vargas only hung around till round 10 because of the toughness that is just built in him. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of Vargas. He's been on the show before. I was, I was... I was kind of rooting for him a, a little bit, even though I really like Liam Smith being a, you know, a fellow Brit. But um, no, very, very impressive win from Liam Smith. I just hope that there's a big fight next because he certainly deserves it, and he's still one of the best fighters at at 154. But just doesn't really get the mention, I don't think, amongst some of the other names that are around there, like the Lubins and people like that. I mean. Yeah, I think he's a hard fight for someone like a Fundora. A hard fight for any of them guys, really. But he just doesn't seem to get mentioned enough. But hopefully this win on US soil can put him in a few conversations with guys over there. And um, maybe they're going to want to see him again. Because, you know, he's been out there a couple of times. Boxed Mungia out there. Boxed uh, Canelo out there in Texas. So I think he's probably earned the respect of the US boxing fans anyway. Um, so yeah, great stuff for him. And then the main event, wow, one of the best female fights you will see certainly all year. Probably one of the best fights you're going to see all year, male or female. And probably one of the best female fights of all time. Katie Taylor, still the undisputed lightweight female world champion. She was able to beat Amanda Serrano on a split decision over 10 two-minute rounds. Serrano now 42-2 and with a draw. Katie Taylor 21-0. and um, scorecards in the end, some people weren't happy. I mean, some people felt that Serrano won the fight. And if you did think Serrano won the fight, then you should probably put me on mute right now because you're going to be quite angry with my scorecard. Um, round one I gave to Taylor. I think that... Um, uh, I liked her jab. It was sharp. It was quick. It was precise. I liked her counter punching. Serrano was coming forward, but not really landing anything effective. Round two, it was pretty much more of the same from Katie. She was starting to get into a groove, showing the excellent footwork, showing the excellent jab. Really clever stuff. Uh, much more flu, uh, you know, fluent, I guess, than than Serrano. Good fight at that point. I think Katie was kind of in and out, not really interested in trading. Round three was where it started to heat up. It was a better round for Serrano, particularly towards the end of the round. She was catching Katie with some nice shots. Katie was still, for me, getting the better of it. Some people, I think, gave that round to Serrano. I think Chris Mannix actually had it 2-1 to Serrano after three. I've got it 3-0 to Katie, so uh, I'm not sure. Round four, I gave to Serrano. 
just, just about. Um, I think the bigger shots were, were landed by Serrano. I think Taylor wasn't as mobile as she'd been in previous rounds. And Taylor was also letting her hands go and looking good when doing so. But I liked what Amanda was doing more. And, and um, Amanda, at times, I felt should have been jabbing her way in. She was kind of walking into shots, trying to get into range, even if they weren't big shots, but they were they were point-scoring shots. But I still gave the round to Serrano. Um, round five, obviously a massive round for Serrano. Taylor was almost out on her feet, fighting on instinct. She got caught in the corner and opted to trade with Serrano, which was an awful idea. Uh, there was no real need for it. It was very risky, and it almost paid off for Serrano. Um, it was arguable. On my, I actually wrote this before I even realized that the one of the judges, I think, gave it a 10-8 round, but I thought it could have been... You know, there was argument for a 10-8 round, really. She was battering Taylor from pillar to post, and Taylor's nose was a real mess. There was blood all over her face. Um, they said that Serrano landed 44 punches in that two-minute round, which is crazy, man. So I had it 3-2 for Taylor after five rounds, and then I literally gave Taylor, I think, almost every round from that point. Um, round six, I gave to Taylor. Um, her legs didn't look right, but Serrano went back to not setting anything up and just trying to walk through Taylor. So for me, she lost a round. Round seven, I gave it to Taylor. Serrano barely landed a punch. Most of her uh, punches fell short. She landed a couple body shots, but Katie was back to her jab and the straight shots, and they were paying off. Uh, round eight was a Taylor round, clearly. Serrano was either gassing at that point, like gassed out or had run out of ideas. She couldn't seem to get close to Taylor and land anything of note. And Taylor was using her superior boxing skills and the footwork had come back into it. And round nine I gave to Taylor. And then round ten, um, an unbelievable round, of course, to top off the, 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 the fight. Especially the last ten seconds or so when they were just throwing haymakers from their knees. And I gave the last round also to Katie, so... Yeah, for me, she closed the show, even though she did get buckled in the last few seconds. But yeah, it finished with, like I say, both girls uh, bruised, bloodied. It was an unbelievable fight. And hats off, man, because it was unbelievable. You know, if we had a male fight where that stuff went down, we'd be applauding it all over the world. And we should do the same here for these for these ladies. But in the end, I actually had it eight rounds to two for Katie Taylor. That's if I didn't give... Uh, that fifth round, the 10-8 for Amanda Serrano, which I don't really like to do too often, the 10-8 round without a knockdown or a point took off. But it was a circumstance where maybe you could have gone there. But I'm not a judge. That was just my card. So in the end, 8-2 is really wide. But I think the, the general cards I was seeing, I think maybe even two of the judges had it 7-3. I can, I can completely get on board with that. Um... But yeah, I can't see any way you can give Serrano the fight. Some people were saying that. And I'm kind of sick of this, Eddie, because I don't know if you even scored it. I know you probably saw bits of it, but I'm sick of people scoring a fight and scoring rounds to people that just come forward. It's like 95% of people do that. It's not about the guy who's coming forward or the, or the female in this instance that's coming forward. It's about the punches landed clean, man. It's right. simple. Like... I understand if it's kind of 50 50 and the guy mm -hmm. who's the, you know, or the girl, the aggressor, you, you can side with the aggressor, but it, it right. should be punches landed, not who's going forward and who's going backwards, man. Facts is like a lot of times people, you know, they don't, it's, it's they're, they're, they're forgetting the criteria that they're forgetting all of them together, which is clean punching, which is the main one. I mean, that's obviously the main one. Then it's ring, you know, ring generalship. Effective aggressiveness, right? Defense, with and all of these things, with a stronger emphasis on clean punching. But you got to think about if she's coming forward ineffectively, and Amanda and and not Amanda and uh, Katie Taylor's landing multiple shots clean, and she's missing, and then she lands one big shot. Now, granted, a big shot if it buckles, or you know that's something nice, but if she's landing three to one, using the ring effectively pulling her into shots, making her miss. She's literally doing ma the majority of the criteria. The only thing is she's not is, is the only thing she's not doing is effective aggressiveness because she's moving, but she's using the ring generalship aspect as well as the clean punching and defense. You understand what I'm saying? It's three to one if you think about the criteria, right? So people that are judging the fight, watching it, and they're seeing that, or there's people that, I mean, and there's judges, not just people who's 
you know, watch the fights and judge by their own count. There are actually judges that literally count punches or try to count punches. And whoever threw, keep in mind, threw more punches, they likely would give them the round. And that's just completely ridiculous. Like, how could you think about giving a round to someone who, just because they threw a lot of punches, but missed most of them, <clears throat> and were getting picked off with counter shots, if that was the case, Floyd Mayweather would have lost a lot more than one fight. You understand what I'm saying? And even then, he makes people put their hands in their pocket because they can't reach him. You know, what, you, know you understand what I'm saying? So I'm in agreement with you. I don't know about the 8-2. You know what I mean? There might have been a round or so in there. I thought she was a little more effective with her punches than, than Katie was. But all in all, no doubt about it, I thought Katie Taylor, especially those first three rounds when a lot of people were actually thinking that Amanda Serrano was winning those rounds. I was like, how are they giving her rounds when she's getting hit multiple times coming in and not really landing anything effective? You understand? That, that was just my opinion. And then I was thinking, am I crazy? And then I heard um, my man, um, uh, man, I can't even think of his name right now. He was he was on the he was on the broadcast too. Uh, crap! What is wrong with my brain? <laughs> oh my gosh! Why can't I remember his name? We I was just oh, I was spar with him when I was over there. <sighs> oh, Bellu! Sorry, Bellu. <laughs> yeah, hey, my man Tony. How can I not remember Tony? Anyway, Tony Bellu. He, I, when he said three nothing, I was like, oh, so it wasn't just me. You know what I mean? And I seen Chris Maddox at two and one. I was like, okay. Because I'm hearing other people saying, oh, I, two rounds. And they, I think they were saying that Amanda Serrano. I was like, what? She's up? What? And then, you know, when those other rounds came up and they were saying, I'm like, wow. I was listening to these cards. I was like, I had, I guess I have no idea what, how to score score fights. So I said, you know what? Let me just stop scoring it. So I just really stopped scoring it and was just watching it and just enjoying the entertainment value of it. Because when and that's why a lot of people want to turn the sound off. Because then you're listening to the influence from from the people who are talking, from the from the pundits. And it's like sometimes that can influence your decision on what you think is going on or, you know, and, and let you okay, well they said that round was close. Okay, what I get no. You need to hold steady to your car. Whatever your car was, that's your car. And then match it up with the rest of them afterwards. But it's crazy. I mean, there's a lot of that going on. That's why there's a lot of bad decisions in boxing, honestly, because there's so many different ways that these people score it, and they're not even they're not even take, pay, take into account the the criteria. That's how you're supposed to view the fights. You know what I mean? That's professional scoring. But a lot of them, like I said, that one one judge I just told you, literally, she count tried to count punches, and and would say that okay because they were aggressive with the punches that they won the round. And this is why boxing is where it is in a lot of ways when it comes to the scoring. Yeah, I mean, I will just say that obviously scoring a two-minute round can be difficult sometimes. I think that's... But I don't think it really applied to this fight in particular. I don't think... I mean, there were some close rounds. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I just think in the past people have said, hey, it's hard to score a two-minute round. And not only that, yeah. but there were scores completely all over the place. Like, when I was looking on social media, some people actually are claiming it was, you know, that Serrano was robbed, and I'm thinking, what? Hmm. Like, it was yeah. just, it was crazy. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's a yeah. fast-paced round. It's, you know, the, the rounds go quicker, and it is, I think, a mm -hmm. little bit harder to score. I'll, I'll throw that in there. But people weren't happy with the commentary at all. They felt that the commentary was really biased towards, um, towards Serrano from the get-go. Um, I do. I think so too. I think so too. A lot of, with the exception of Tony Bellew, I thought that um, was it. Who was that? Uh, was that Jessica? What's her name? McCaskill. Yeah, I didn't like yeah. that. I've got to be honest. I like she McCaskill, was, but God. she was. Yeah, but she was so. It seems like she was so biased to Amanda Serrano. I was like, wow. This kind of reminds me of Love George Foreman. But he was the, one of the biggest Oscar De La Hoya fans back in the day. I don't know. You're probably kind of young to remember this. But he used to talk. I don't care who he was fighting. Oscar De La Hoya doing this. Oscar De La Hoya doing that. And it just kind of takes me back to those. I, you know, I'm a huge boxing guy. Obviously, I spent years in it. But um, to hear that, and it's like trying to sway people's decision on what's actually happening, sometimes it's just best to turn the sound off. Or at least try to turn if you could if you could if there was an option to turn the commentary off, 
because it's just so bad. You sometimes you hear these things, and then it upsets you. It upsets it upsets me watching it, thinking of these these fighters and 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 knowing that sometimes these things can influence, obviously influence judges because some judges are, you know, like, they like the crowd and just and then and then on top of that, now you're hearing the commentary of your home watching. It's just like wow, this is crazy. <laughs> it's insane. But all in all, great fight. Great for women's boxing. I'm so I'm so happy to see both of them deserve a whole a, a real pat on the back at the very least. And um, you know, hopefully, you know, that doing women's boxing continue because I because there's I could just see women fight hard. They really fight hard. They it's like they're trying to get respect every time out. Uh, you know what I mean from everyone. So I mean, they really fight hard. If you've watched, I've even even the fight uh, a couple of weeks ago we were watching. Uh, those two girls go at it, and I'm like, wow, they're they're literally fighting tooth and nail, like they want to, like they're trying to kill each other just for the, for people's entertainment. I think the respect needs to be given to them just as they do the men. This was a great fight, a great event, headliner, deservingly so. Pay per view, people need to pay take notice and and, and really start to pay more attention to women's boxing because I think it's uh, I think it's on upswing now. Yeah, it is. And as you said, you know, they deserve a pat on the back. I think both ladies have done so much for the women's game. I mean, Katie Taylor, I don't want to say in particular, but she's done so much. And Amanda Serrano has done so much. And it was the best against the best. And they, they're they both role models, as I said. They've both done so much for, for the sport. And we never knew, though, if it was actually going to be a good fight. So the fact that it was a good fight as well, one of the best fights you're going to see, it's like the cherry on the icing on the cake, man. Everything come together. There was nothing bad, nothing negative about any of it. The fight was great. They're both great people. They've both done amazing things. And um, it was just, it was so well deserved. And... Um, you know, they're both heroes, really, for women's boxing, both of them in their own rights from very different places, but they've both uh, done, you know, very similar, brilliant, you know, great things and had such a fantastic, positive impact on women's boxing, which was needed. Um, and I just want to say as well, like, I've been called a, like a, a Katie Taylor hater. I've been blocked before by by uh, people that really like her on Twitter. I was certainly not being biased to Katie Taylor with my scorecard. I actually uh, bet on Serrano to win on points. That was my pick. It didn't come close to happening, in my opinion. So there's no reason why I would have been siding with, uh, with, with Katie Taylor to win at all. But no, very, very, very happy with the fight. Great stuff. Um, let's move on, though. That is it for the preview part of the show. There is nothing to move on to. That's the end of, of part one. The final thing for me to do just before we wrap it up is to welcome our special guest on this week's podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated former two-time WBC super middleweight world champion. It is, of course, Mr. David Benavidez. David, welcome back on the show, my man. Thank you for having me on, brother. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure speaking with you, my friend. That's the truth. Um, so, David, we last spoke back in July. At that point, you were scheduled to fight Uzkategi. Obviously, that fight fell through. Instead, you ended up boxing in November against Kyron Davis. I remember tweeting during that fight. I remember tweeting, my words were, Benavidez is a savage. You were so dominant. Uh, Davis, to his credit, had a lot of balls. But, you know, he took a hell of a beating. Fond memories looking back on that fight, David? Yeah, it was uh, it was definitely a great experience. I was a little sad because I was looking forward to the fight with Jose Uskateki. It was a fight that meant a lot uh, to me um, because Uskateki is an ex-world champion, so I think it would look better in my resume. And um, I had specifically trained for him, but he did what he did. The fight fell out, and so that's why I got to give my hats up. Uh, I've got to got to give it up to Kyron Davis because he took the fight on sh short notice. Um, it was a tough fight. Um, it was it wasn't really a tough fight. Um, he was moving around a lot. I think uh, he felt my power right from the beginning, so he really tried to move, try to survive as much as possible. But I, I knew I had him. It was, but it, uh, overall, it was a very fun experience. Just being back at home, fighting in front of my people, and it was it was it was uh, just a really great experience. Just being back in there again, you know, going from fighting in, in a bubble my past two fights to you know nearly a sold out crowd in Phoenix, Arizona. So it, it was a blast. And I remember as well, you were 
upset that the fight with Uskategi fell for. I remember you telling me that you you were desperate to become the first man to knock him out. Um, anyway, getting on to what's next for you. David versus David. Benavidez versus, versus Lemieux. May 21st in Glendale. Um, live on Showtime. Most people I've spoken to, David, feel that this will be an easy fight for you. Do you feel that this is an easy fight for you? Um, I, I don't, I'm not going to say it's going to be an easy fight because, uh, I just have to give every man the respect and I have to give every man the benefit of the doubt that he's going to be the best version of himself when he gets there. It might be an easy fight, but in my head, I'm willing to put it all in line. You know, I'm working extremely hard. I've been in training camp for a long time. Um, I've, I've given it, I've given my all to this training camp. I've worked extremely hard. So, but um, honestly, that's the real battle right there, the training camp, putting everything into the training camp, working hard as, um, hard as ever. And the fights, all fights, you know, should be easy because this is what we love to do. But um, like I said, I'm giving um, David Lemieux, you know, I think he's going to be very motivated. I think he's going to be, you know, probably the best David Lemieux I've seen. So that's what I'm preparing for, and that's what I'm preparing to beat as well. Yeah, I think for David, it's pretty much a last chance saloon, um, you know, Obviously, in boxing, you've you've they they always say the power's the last thing to leave you. He certainly has power. There's no question about that. I just wondered what kind of chance do you feel he, that he has? Obviously, he was a big puncher at 160, a world champion there, but it seems like now he's kind of over the hill a little bit with respect to him. Um, I just wanted to see how he he holds up. In the beginning, and I have to go in there. I have to be smart. I can't be reckless. You know, he does have a huge left hook. And he have, sometimes when he gets people hurt, he rallies pretty good. So the defense has to be tight. The decisions have to be made really good. Um, but I'm just going gonna, gonna to go in there and do what I have to do. Um, use the jab, find the distance, throw combinations, and go down to the body. His last two fights at 168, I seen, um, I think, like two fights ago or three fights ago, he fought... Uh, forgot he fought like a Russian dude or something and it was like his third fight ago and he got dropped he won but he got dropped in the first round and then uh, he was hurt was, was it Bursa? Couple times. was it Bursa? I yeah, think Bursa, I think I think it was him it was a good fight he won but I mean um I, I'm a way better fight than the other guy and I'm stronger I'm younger um but like I said I, I've seen a lot of holes in that fight and they, there's a lot of opportunities to hurt him and I feel like I'm I'm way stronger than the guy he fought. So, and right now it's just the perfect time for me. You know, I have a lot of momentum right now. I'm working extremely hard. I feel great, and I'm going to be fighting for another title. So, I mean, the the every everything is aligned for me to go in there and, and look spectacular. I worked extremely hard. Now it's my time to get another title, and I'm gonna go in there and I'm I'm gonna leave that arena with the title. And David Lemieux, obviously a very experienced fighter. We've got to give him that as well. You know, 43 wins, uh, just four losses. Those four losses, two by decision, two by a KO in round seven and eight. He's never been stopped in the first half of a fight. I know the kind of guy you are. Is that something that's in the back of your mind? You'd like to get him out of there in the first half, maybe? Do something that, that hasn't been done before to him? Maybe. Um, I feel like I never like to rush rush myself. Um, I'm going to go in there, follow the game plan. But if there's opportunity to do that, then we're definitely going to push for it. But, I mean, if I have to, you know, go on my pace, you know, I'm slow him down. And then maybe in the middle of the fight or the end of the, of the, of the, or the final, uh, the final half of the fight, um, it, it just depends. I feel like for me, I don't like to rush myself. I like to do everything right. You know, minimize the chances of me getting caught with anything or me getting, you know, uh, hit with something big. And just do my job. I mean, I feel like the stoppage is a stoppage, no matter if it comes in the first half of the fight or the second half of the fight. So, if my my plan is definitely to get a stoppage, it doesn't matter if this is the first or the second half of the fight. For sure. And the thing about you, David, that makes you really exciting, in my opinion, isn't just your fighting style. I really have always been a big fan of your personality. You're real. You're unfiltered. You're honest. Uh, you know, you, you, as you said there, you want to knock this guy out. You've said that for, for pretty much every fight I've spoken to you before. You want all the smoke you always have done. Um, I understand for this fight, it's not like it's just a random non-title fight against Lemieux. Not, not much at stake. No other reason than to get, you know, a nice win. I understand it's for the interim belt, the WBC interim belt. But 
Can you tell us maybe when you feel we'll see you in a ring with the likes of someone like a Danny Jacobs, a Saunders, a Plant, an Andre, a Charlo, a Golovkin, someone like that? I know you want those fights. To be to be honest, I'm ready for them right now. I'm ready to fight any one of those guys right now. But like I said, um, all the guys that I I'm, I want to fight and I pull I you know try to get these fights. They always say that you, there's very little very little reward for big risks. But right now, I feel like once I get this title, I'll have more leverage to make these fights happen because the interim title I'll, I'll be I'll be I'd have the interim title. So. Whenever, you know, I feel like I'm ready after this fight, whoever wants to get it, I'm right here ready for them. Um, but first things first, I got to go out there, get the title. And then after that, I think maybe by the end of this year, we could land a big fight. I don't know with who, but um, I feel like the big fights are going to come after this one. Yeah, and respect to David Lemieux. I don't want to overlook him in any way. As I say, he's, he's, he's definitely a puncher uh, that, that can switch people's lights out with one shot. But just my last question on kind of other guys, apart from Canelo, because everyone, of course, wants that massive fight, but who do you want to fight most out of anyone in the world apart from Canelo, David? I want to fight, well, there's a couple guys. There's Caleb Plant, there's Charlo, and there's uh, Bubu Andrade. Um, those are the three guys I'd like to, love to make a uh, fight happen with. And I feel like those fights are really possible to make probably this year or the beginning of the of, or next year. So I'm very excited. You know, I know everybody's out staking out a fight with Canelo, but I feel like if I got to make my own route, then that's not a problem either. Um, I, there's a lot of great fights to be made in the PBC side. There's also, also David Moreau. That's de- definitely a huge fight. So I'm ready for whatever. If I got to go through all those guys and get my experience and then, I feel like once I beat all those guys, a fight with Canelo would be more lucrative and it would be a bigger fight at the end of the day, then that's what's going to happen. But I'm ready for whoever, whoever, whenever, I'm ready. And I believe you when you say that. I want to ask you this as well, David. It's a, it's not a guy I'm thinking of as an opponent for you. It's, it's pretty much a step backwards. But I just wanted to get your opinion on Edgar Belanga. Obviously, he gathered all these first-round knockouts. He's younger than yourself. He's a guy that people were talking about as this new, young, danger man in the division. Something people had said about you for years. What's your thoughts on him when he was coming through? Well, when he was coming up, I thought I, I still wanted to fight him. I wanted to fight him when he was at his most dangerous. And when everybody thought he was the next guy coming up, that he was just going to walk through everybody. This was two fights ago. I had called him out, and we had called his team, see if we can make the fight happen. The fight wasn't able to make it happen, so we just continued to do what we're doing. But I would still love to fight Edgar Berlanga. I feel like it would be a very big fight. You know, uh, anyways, besides what's going on right now, um, I feel like he's not – it's not my – it's not my problem or it, I'm not going to be trying to, you know, be like, Oh, he's not ready. You know, I'll wait till he gets ready. I'm ready. We're, we're the same age. So if they want to make the fight happen, we can make it happen. If he's not ready, that's not my problem. You know, um, like I said, we're the, we're the exact same age, 25 years old. And, you know, I've worked my way up here. I got the experience. I beat all these guys and, you know, I'm ready for whoever, you know, I feel like if he's not ready for, you know, championship fights like that, then he should just stay down there at the level with the mother guys because, you know, if you're ready, if you're really going to call somebody out, you better be ready to fight him, whatever. You know, and that's the thing, that's the difference between me and them. Me and him, you know, he's saying that he's not ready right now, but, you know, I feel like if you're not ready right now, don't don't even put yourself next to those guys, those, those top-level fighters, because you can't be calling somebody out, but then stay, still say you need some time to get ready. Like, it just doesn't make sense. But if he wants to fight him, I'm all for it. Uh, that would be a big fight. It would be a huge fight. I know he has a big fan base. I got a big fan base, and we can make a big event out of it. But I would definitely be knocking him out whenever that fight does happen. And I want to ask about the environment in the gym right now. Am I right in saying that you've obviously got yourself, um, your, your brother Jose, and Diego Pacheco all in the same gym now? Yeah, and then we got Raul Valenzuela. Okay. So um, I'm just very excited, too, you know, just for the future of the, the team. Um, you know, I, I feel like my brother was the one that started everything. He put his he put his foot in the door, and um, I'm, I'm the one who got in after. And now we got Jose Valenzuela, you know, Diego Pacheco. He's been doing his thing, but now we're all together. And, you know, we all feed off each other's energy. Everybody's working extremely hard. And I feel like we could, put, we could probably have one of the best teams in boxing right now. And, you know, uh, we're all willing to get to the next level, and we all help each other get to the next level. And it's not just, it's not just the fighters either; it's the trainers too. We got some great trainers with us. We got a, 
my father Jose Benavides, Poncho Ramirez, or uh, and then uh, Chris Danina, Shay, and then we got Carlos Green. There's a lot of good people here. There's a lot of good people that are putting their heads together, and you know we just want to get to the next level. So, well, I'm really excited for the future. No, it's a dream team. It really is. This weekend, Canelo Bivol. Uh, some people don't like the fight. Some people do like the fight. Are you a fan of the fight? And how do you see it playing out? I mean, yeah, it's a good fight. I mean, for the for the division, there's not really too much other fights to be made. There's either Bivol, and then there's Joe Smith and and Berta Beef. So I mean, I mean for Canelo, I mean he's doing the right thing. You know, he's going. Uh, he took that route. Um, I felt like the people wanted him to take the route of PBC, which would have been bigger fights, in my opinion, with Charlo and then with me, obviously. But uh, Canelo is his own man. And, um, you know, I'm not going to knock him. I'm not going to hate on him. He does what he wants. And if he wants to go, you know, get belts at 175, then I feel like Dimitri, uh, uh, Dimitri Bivol, he's a great fighter. Uh, I've sparred him before. I know him personally. So it'll be a great fight. I mean, if he could go and get the belts and kudos to him, you know, it's a big accomplishment. Um, but I'm, I will definitely be watching the fight. It's going to be a good fight, and I'm, ex- I'm looking forward to it too. And just finally, before we let you go, David, I always like to just give you an opportunity to send a message to anyone that could be listening, particularly, uh, you know, in the UK where I'm from. Obviously, you've got a huge fan base at home. You've got a huge fan base overseas. I mean, we absolutely love the Benavidez family. Obviously, you've got your father, the trainer, such a good guy. I know him personally. Jose, we've seen him in tremendous fights. You as well doing unbelievable. Even it goes as far as your son, the best dressed baby in the whole world. Just send a message to this to, to, to your fan base overseas, my man, before we let you go. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody in the UK, um, everybody in London. You know, I, I appreciate everybody, all the love and support. You know, even everybody in Europe, man. Um, I have a lot of support from everywhere, and I just feel very grateful to not even be in those countries over there, but, you know, still, you know, ringing, ringing bells out there and, you know, making noise out there. So, but honestly, if, I, I just want to say if it wasn't for the people, you know, I wouldn't. I don't even know where I'd be. You know, the people are the ones that get me to here to this position, and um, motivate me to be an even better version of myself. So I just want to thank everybody for the love and support, and I can't wait to put these great fights up for all my fans everywhere in the world in the future. And we'd love to have you over here in the UK. Hopefully it happens one day. Listen, David, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you, my friend. It always is. You're one of my favorite people to speak to in the world. Best of luck, May 21st, and we'll speak again sometime afterwards. Yes, sir. I hope you guys have a good day. Thank you, man. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. We're going to start here with a fight that's been added to the Javante Davis Rolando Romero undercard, which again is May 28th. We're going to see on the undercard Eris Landy Lara defend his WBA middleweight world title against Gary Spike O'Sullivan. Uh, friend of the show, O'Sullivan. Haven't spoke to him for a few years, to be honest, but all the best to him. But yeah, a lot of people not too happy with that. They think it's a mismatch. Um, what else do we have? Richard Riakpor is going to be boxing on June 11th. He gets in with the undefeated Italian, Fabio Turchi. Uh, that one is a world title eliminator and also on that undercard. This date, by the way, as I say, is, is uh, June 11th. And it's in the Wembley Arena. We've got Chris Congo getting in with Sebastian Formella, the guy that went the distance with Sean Porter then, I think. Did he get knocked out by Conor Ben or if he went the distance? Can't remember now. Um, and yeah, another good fight as well on the undercard between Jermaine Brown and Zach Chelly. That one's for the English super middleweight title. Um, Joe Cordina will be boxing for the IBF Super Featherweight World title against the champion Kenichi Ogawa, the Japanese fighter. Uh, That one's going to go down June 4th, live on the zone. It's going to be in Cordina's backyard of Cardiff, so that's excellent for him. Really, really pleased for him. I mean, this is his chance to you know, to to win a world title. A lot of people are very high on him from all over the world, to be honest. I remember Shakur Stevenson saying to me a few weeks ago that he's the he's the British fighter around my weight that that is the best. You know, he's better than all these other guys in Britain. He's the guy. And here is his opportunity to prove so. Uh, Brad Foster gets in the ring with Iron Baluta. That one to take place on uh, the 20th of 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 May, so not too long now. It's going to be going down in York Hall. Um, 
Baluta's been in with a few Irish people in a row. He's been in with Michael Conlon, TJ Doheny, and I think it was David Oliver Joyce. So he gets in with Brad Foster, who I think is is coming off a loss, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, that one could be interesting there. Um, what else do we have? Uh, May 28th, Anthony Peterson returns to the ring um, as well. He gets in with... Um, I think it's Saul Coral, who's 23 and 18. That's an eight rounder there, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, that is it for the news part of the show. Moving on to the preview part, not too much at all to go over, just two cards. Uh, one card, we're going to start with this one here. It, it takes place in Michigan, USA. We've got Cornelius Bundridge, who just turned 49. Um, he shares the same birthday as me, so he turned 49. Um, what was it a couple of weeks ago now? Um, so yeah, he is thirty-seven and six in a six-rounder against Stephen Matthews, who's five and one. All the best to Cornelius Bundridge, uh, friend of the show. Um, and yeah, the the main event, I should say, while I remember right now, happy Cinco de Mayo to our Mexican listeners. But yeah, let's go there. Let's go there. T-Mobile Arena, the zone, Las Vegas, Nevada, USA. Let's start with the undercard first. Mark Castro, 6-0, and the, the young, uh, highly touted prospect in an eight-rounder against Pedro Vicente Shabai, who's 7-4 and with a draw. We've got Zili Zhang, 23-0 and with a draw in a 10-rounder. He was supposed to be taking on Filip Hergovic. Unfortunately, Hergovic's dad passed away. So he's pulled out of the fight, and in steps late replacement Scott Alexander, 16-4 and with two draws. Um... It's good for Zhang, really, because Zhang, I think, was literally going to get decapitated. Well, not I don't want to say literally decapitated, but he was going to get knocked out, I think. And, um, yeah, he is, he is getting in with Scott Alexander, who he's going to probably beat, to be honest, but still not entirely sure about that. I think Zili Zhang is there for the taking against a decent heavyweight. Um, Jose Lito Velasquez is 14 and 0 with a draw he's in a 10 rounder against Jose Soto who is 15 and 1 we've got Shakram Giasov 12 and 0 fighting for the vacant IBF North American welterweight title over 10 rounds against Christian Gomez 22 and 2 with a draw we've got uh, Montana Love as well really happy to see him on a big card here it's for the IBF North American super lightweight title he has been ticking all the boxes recently 17 and 0 with a draw in a 12 rounder against Gabriel Valenzuela who's 25 and Two with a draw, and then the main event: Dimitri Bivol, nineteen and zero, friend of the show, defending his WBA Super World Light Heavyweight title against Saul Canelo Alvarez, fifty-seven and one with two draws, twelve rounds. Um, do you know what? I haven't given this fight much thought to be honest, because it's come round really quickly. But I mean, I'd love to see Bivol do it. Um, yeah. Eddie, I'm really unsure because because when I think about the fight, I'm not sure if Bivol has got a great style to like like a, a a good style to give Canelo loads of problems, or he doesn't have the good style at all. I'm not sure. I'm kind of caught between. Is he going to cause <laughs> loads of problems, or is he going to be really ineffective? I'm really stuck. You know what's crazy? Uh, <laughs> I was kind of thinking that too because <laughs> you know he's kind of like a his, his style is kind of like a busy. You know, touch you, pop, 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 quick. You know, little combinations, little stuff like that. And it's like, can the can the range <clears throat> and his ability, like his in and out and all that, the stuff that he does so well, can that really work for him? But the guy's crafty and as slick as Canelo. <laughs> you would think possibly because he might be able to keep the range. But he would have to make Canelo respect him. And not only would he have to make Canelo respect him, he would have to be able to land punches consistently, which we don't know. Now, is he fast enough? Does he have an, uh, is he accurate enough? You know what I mean? Because he's not used to fighting guys who are going to move their head and be defensively as sound as Canelo is and not as, cre- as crafty with the counter punches, too. You know, he's normally that guy who's, you know, the counter punching, busy punching, keeping guys on the end of his shots. It's going to be a little different. Now he's going to have somebody kind of most likely, which I would think, pressing the action, being a difficult target as they're being aggressive. You know what I'm saying? It's like Canelo, I, it's just it's just hard for me because haven't, we haven't seen him in any real 
uh, adversity at this point. You know what I'm saying? Dimitri Bivol, I'm talking about. So it's kind of hard to say, well, if he starts to have a tough time, what will he be able to resort to? How could he make an adjustment? And this is always the case with guys who are high level, high high level fighters or or prospects or something like that that come into all of a sudden to a a neck another level. You know what I'm saying? Now, the one thing that we, you know, I don't want to say the elephant in the room. I mean, because he's competed at that weight before, but he he is once again going up to 175. He he does he did well, obviously, in beating. Um, uh, Kovalev, but Kovalev was a little bit on the outs, and Kovalev was actually in the fight. So Kovalev was I, winning the fight. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So Bivo being a live guy, a guy, a proud guy, a guy that is expecting to win and expecting to do what nobody thinks he's going to do. He's going to get in there and give everything he has. But this just makes me think. Go back to think about. And I know I'm kind of bouncing all around a little bit, but <clears throat> this makes me go back to thinking about the fight that um, that uh, that Canelo had with um, damn with with Danny Jacobs. You remember how, like the fight we had with Danny Jacobs when Danny Jacobs was he trying to be busy, trying to put his jab on him, literally just poking shots at him like a. It was almost like a fencing match. He was trying to, I got to touch him. I got to touch him. And he couldn't. And it's like, that was a, a weight class or two below. And he couldn't even touch him. So, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that just because the, these guys, those guys are smaller, that they're going to be faster or more accurate. But you would think that the pace was faster and that Bivol would have to literally step up to a level like that to even try to be in contact with him. Now, Danny Jacobs did okay in that times. He won a few rounds, but <clears throat> he was no longer he was no no closer to winning a fight than somebody who didn't fight at all. You understand what I'm saying? Or or, or didn't win a round at all. So it's like I just wait, don't wait, wait. say I, that again. I meant Jacobs. to say it was <laughs> Yeah, Jacobs, Danny Jacobs. Yeah, but that was a close fight that he had with Canelo. Was it? Yeah, was it? man. Like how close was it? Like right, was, was it close enough for him, him to win? He pushed him. I feel like Do you remember what the score, think... I'm going to remind you of the scorecards if you forgot. Okay, let me, let it me, was let me, let me. 115, 113 twice and 116, 112. All three for Yeah, all for three Canelo, for right? Canelo. Yeah, but 7, 5, 7, 115, 5, 8, 4. 115, 113. To, I don't know. I got I to gotta watch it again. No, it but I just fight, remember man. it was a good fight and I think Danny, and I like Danny, I wanted to see Danny win. <clears throat> I just think that he couldn't connect enough. He couldn't do the things like Canelo slipping, landing big shots. I don't think – I mean, I guess if you say, okay, 115, 113, might be a, that might be a little generous. I would have thought a little bit wider. I thought it was a little bit wider. And it was just because he couldn't sustain any real offense. Like he was, he was landing shots periodically, but they weren't like shots that you could really say, oh, damn. Oh, that was – oh, great shot. Because Canelo was just too slick, too crafty, and he wasn't able to get his hands on it. I remember one series he was throwing like, I don't know, he threw like 10, 12 punches and literally missed every single one. You understand what I'm saying? And that pace is much faster than what he's going to be facing in the Wabivo. Now, of course, he's a little bit heavier himself and moving up to a different weight. <clears throat> but I always said this, when guys are lighter weight and moving up to the next weight class, if they can just, if they can deal with the strength and size and, and, and power difference, they're going to be a tough matchup because the pace of it is going to be different. They're going to push the pace. You understand what I'm saying? They're going to be moving more. They're going to be throwing possibly more punches. Just the activity level of their movement causes, it, like I've, I've experienced it myself, it causes you to have to do things a little faster than you're comfortable. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm not saying that Bivol is not going to be able to win the fight or not control the fight or whatever. It's possible. He can use his range. He can use, you know, his ability to punch the long, you know, his his the way his style is and all. But I just I just see it as it could be problematic for him too. If he if he doesn't get if he doesn't if he can't keep Canelo out if he can't get the respect from him he's gonna he's gonna have a really really tough night. <clears throat> yeah, again, I just kind of think he's either gonna be a really, I think it's gonna probably be a really tactical affair like a chess match. When I really think about it now. Um, I agree. I, I, it's, it's hard though I don't know because 
I was just looking back on his record when you spoke about Jacobs. I thought that was quite close. And then after that, he goes on to have the fight with Kovalev, the very next fight. A fight he's losing until he gets Kovalev out of there in round 11, by the way. It was almost like he needed a knockout, almost. Um, and then he, he beats Callum Smith, who didn't really come to fight, to be honest. And I love Callum Smith, but that's the truth, in my opinion. He, he came to survive. Uh, then he blasted out Avni Yildirim. That was a gross mismatch. Then he had what was, you know, um, a close-ish fight with Billy Joe Saunders up until the stoppage. Then he had a close-ish fight against Caleb Plant up until the stoppage. Now he's getting back in at 175 against a guy who has got that freshness, who, as you said, throws punches and moves, good feet, good judge of distance, does the basics really, really well. Um, I don't know. It's going to be tactical. I don't know if it's going to be fireworks, to be honest. I think this fight could be very tactical and... And and mm-hmm. maybe close on the cards, man. I mean, possibly. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. I, I it's think... a shame that he never ended up boxing at cruiserweight for whatever reason. That fight fell away when he was going to box. Um, oh, what was that guy's name again? Um, guy that Tony Bell you knocked out. Mm. Oh man, <laughs> um, Ilunga Makabu. Shame that that yeah, fight never came came off because he was massive compared to Canelo. But I don't know why it fell through and it just fell through. But it, I mean, we 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 can both agree on this, I think, Eddie, that Bivol is one of the hardest fights that Canelo could have picked. I think. I think so. I think so. I think is this like we said, like I said, you know, looking at <clears throat> the way the fight is tactically, like if he can actually keep him on the end of his shots, it's going to be a hard fight for Canelo. If Canelo can make a miss and do all his little things and and land those big counter punches, then obviously he's going to be on the other end. And we do not know what's going to happen. I know I don't. I don't think that is any definitive way. Just like I'm, ah, I could just. I know Canelo is going to go in there and dominate. Nah, nah. This is not one of those kind of fights. But <clears throat> if Canelo can bring the pace of a smaller fight to Bivol and 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 make him miss, make him pay, even if he can't hurt him. Even if he can't really do a lot of damage to him, he'll still have the more showier shots, the kind of shots that will, you know, that are eye-catching to the judges. He could possibly win a decision. But I do agree that it's still it's not going to be an easy thing, I don't think. And I think you're right about the tact. It is going to be a tactical. It's going to be a think thinking man's kind of fight. And I think that fav- – I think actually I, – I would say it favors Canelo – but I don't know, man. Bebo is good <laughs> from the outside. He's never, he's not being like, he's not one of those guys that are like, um, oh my God, you see how, you know, he got all the sauce and all that. He's pretty, he's pretty basic skill wise, but very, very, very tactical, very, <clears throat> you know, got good hand speed, puts his, puts his punches together, you know, does the basics correctly, like you said. So, um, but maybe that's what, it, maybe that's what's going to give Canelo the problem. Maybe, you know, him not having all that extra stuff is going to make him a bit harder to deal with. So I'm just, <clears throat> it's a great matchup. Canelo picked, they picked this fight for him. So obviously they see something that maybe we don't. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of excited about it. I want to see it. Something I, it's a fight that I, I definitely want to see. You know, I'm, when I think about it, I, 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 I want to see how the styles match up, you know, with each other. I want to see how they do and, who's able to, you know, gain that advantage on the night of the fight. I'm just looking forward to it. Yeah, some people, I think, have, have spoken about Canelo fighting Baturbiev, and it's a fight that we'd all love to see, of course. But I think just because Baturbiev has got the 100% knockout uh, ratio doesn't necessarily mean that he's he's going to be harder to to to, to challenge uh, 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 a harder puzzle to solve for 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 Canelo because uh, again Styles make fights he does have the big punch but I think potentially this fight here against Bivol is a much harder task for Canelo and I say that because Canelo as we know isn't that light on his feet. You know he's he's not he's not light on his feet. He can be if you've got quick feet, you can get in and out. You've got mm-hmm. fast hands, you can land combinations, and just the good movement and a little bit of toughness because you're going to have to soak up some good shots. That mm-hmm. is that that's that's all things that work against Canelo, and that is 
We've seen little glimpses of other guys, like, for example, Amir Khan, good feet, good hand speed. Mm -hmm. He he was doing really good against Canelo. Uh, Billy Joe Saunders, good movement, good feet, doing really good against Canelo. Caleb Plant, at times, was using the shoulder roll, but we know he's got good feet, good judge of distance, good movement. All of this yep. stuff, good movement, is a, it's a pattern when you see Canelo. And even Jacobs, you spoke about it. I didn't think you gave him enough credit, but the, the fact yeah. that he was throwing the combinations and, and getting right. his shots off but we've seen little glimpses of it from all these different guys with different styles but to be honest Bivol's got all of that so that does yeah. intrigue me it really does yeah. and I think yes, um, what... yeah sorry no go ahead Joe go ahead Joe yeah. no I was just going to say I think it is it, he's got all the ingredients to make this very interesting and for Canelo to have to dig deep um, in a mm. weight division that he's not his most comfortable at so I think it's mm. I'm, I'm very excited about the fight now that we've been speaking about it for five minutes here and it's sunk in <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah not because you actually thought about it right and I thought when I heard it was made I've thought about it right then but obviously you forget about it and things come up other big fights are made you know like thinking of these Earl Spence and you know uh, with uh you guys and <clears throat> somebody thought like the Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano fight and you know just different fights like that coming at oh man these are these are good fights and all that. And then you forget about this one that pops up and it's like, well, b is a pretty high level guy. And you think all of the good, all the things he does well. And then you say, damn, Canelo's coming up a couple weight classes. You know, his comfortable weight was supposed to be 160 for or one. Yeah. 160. Actually it was 154 at first. And then he moves up to now, you know, 160 and then fighting 68 and 75. And you got to realize he's moving up to these people's weight. These guys are going to be comfortable there. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying Canelo won't be, but I'm just saying the fact is, Bevo has been there, his, I think, his entire career or most of his career. So <laughs> there's a lot to be said about that too. You know what I mean? But like, I still stand on that. If you if you can bring that lower level, that lower weight pace to a higher higher weight class, it might have the little edge there. But if Bevo, like I said, if he can keep him on the end of those punches. Yeah, I can see that being a very, very, very interesting fight going down the stretch. I just can't wait to see it. It's definitely very interesting. There we go. We'll both be tuned in, I'm sure. But that wraps up the preview part of the show. In part one, we did the review part. Our special guest this week was former two-time... WBC super middleweight world champion, the undefeated Mr. David Benavidez. And in part two, we did the news part and the preview part. The final thing for me to do is to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 342 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge thank you to this week's special guest, the undefeated former two-time WBC super middleweight world champion, David Benavidez. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. There has been one or two pieces of news break whilst we've been recording the show. Unfortunately, Zach Parker versus Demetrius Andrade is off. Demetrius Andrade, unfortunately, suffered an injury so I'm absolutely gutted for Zach Parker really and his team um, had Zach on a few weeks ago hopefully the fight can get rescheduled I'm devastated about that the only good thing that comes out of that is that it now won't clash with Buatsi Richards so that's I guess one positive from the negative in other news following Paul Butler's win last weekend picking up the interim WBO bantamweight world title I don't think it was last weekend I think it was a weekend before that but um, he's now been in, uh, been upgraded Graded to full champion after Casemiro was stripped to the title. So that's a crazy turn of events. But I'm really delighted for friend of the show, Paul Butler. But that's about everything from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe. And we shall see you all again next week.